sour Join us, come and waste an hour or two We've got magic to do just for you Welcome to Studio 10 Talk Intrigue, plots to bring disaster. You know what these are? These are Bob Fosse hands. <laughs> Welcome to Studio 10 Talks. I am Patrick Cassidy, the artistic director of Studio 10. That was our new opening. That was our new opening. I don't have to play this piano anymore live because you know what? I stink on the piano. I, I, I really, I really stink. Um, anyway, uh, I'm so happy with it. You know, call in, write, you know. My producer said, um, it looks like an ad for a Donny Osmond show, but who cares? Uh, anyway, welcome to Studio 10 Talks. I am so thrilled tonight. We have such an incredible show planned. We are now Monday nights. Tonight is our premiere night. And we have Miss Jennifer Turner, the CEO of TPAC. And we have the legendary, the incomparable, I can't even say enough adjectives to describe her, Miss Patty Lapone is here tonight. But I want to remember and remind you all that we in the theater, we make money by selling tickets and getting donations in nonprofit theater. Right now, we can't sell tickets, but we can give donations and get donations. If you guys just look below there, uh, it's going across the screen. Please donate. You guys have kept us around, and we, that's why Studio 10 Talks has become so great, and I, we all appreciate it here. It has been truly amazing. Things have been great. I want to get on with the show. Uh, our first guest. Jennifer Turner is the president and CEO of Tennessee Performing Arts Center. Prior to TPAC, she served as the executive vice president and managing director for the Seeger, I think it's the Seegerstrom Center for the Arts, an acclaimed arts institution in Southern California. I do know it, I've seen it before, with an annual budget of over $60 million, Jennifer, and serving 1 million annual visitors. Bravo. Over 20 years of experience in nonprofit arts, previously was the chief operating officer for the National Historic Landmark Auditorium Theater in Chicago and held roles with Michigan Opera Theater, Shakespeare Theater Company, and Harper College. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jennifer Turner. Hey, Jen. Hi, how are you? How, how are you? Thank you for being here. You are outside. Yes, we're working on Blair Witch the Musical uh, out in the <laughs> wilderness of North Carolina. Did you just come up with this like that, or is that one that you just, is that a stock answer, a stock one that you said? I came up with it during your intro. Oh, of course. Yeah, th those kind of intros, they, they do that to people. They, they, they Inspire. So, um, well, first of all, what are you doing in North Carolina? Um, just doing a little bit of uh, family time, getting a little, uh, you know, COVID relief, getting out of the city, you know, just trying some a different atmosphere. We've kind of been cooped up for a little while. so I, I, I hear you. And you're there for how long? Like until? Uh, just like a little over a couple of weeks. Going to do some hiking in the mountains, some lake time, some Zooms, you know, fit it all in. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a better answer than I thought. Usually the answer when you say and you're there for, oh yeah, till 2.22. We're, we're there until 2.22, no. Well, good, enjoy yourself. I've, I've been to North Carolina, but it's been some time. So first of all, um, I, I, th I think I might've mentioned th this to you. Uh, you know, when we met, we met when I had first arrived here, we had lunch together and you basically were a newbie to Tennessee too uh, when you came in, when, last May, like a year ago? Yeah, yeah, right wow. around. And where were where you, you had been previously in California, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I was uh, at Segerstrom Center in Costa Mesa, where, you know, where all the, the smoke is right now. It's yeah, I know. It's pretty bad down there. Yeah, at, they're, they're wearing masks. I was talking to my son. They're wearing masks just to breathe the air. Forget mm -hmm. COVID. It's just to breathe, you know, because the air is so bad. Yeah, I feel I feel horrible for everyone down there. It's just a tragic situation in California. Yeah, it's awful. Um, so, okay, so and how long were you there in San Diego? Uh, it was actually Orange County, and okay. I was there for about um, six years. Wow, and what was and what was that? That was that your first time running a a performing arts center. Well, I had been the um, the COO at uh, a 
performing arts uh, of a theater with, we just had the, the main theater, historic theater, but then we built another studio. So we were running kind of multiple spaces. But yeah, this was the largest complex. We had a 3000 seat Broadway hall, 2000 seat concert hall. Um, we had other stages. We built a stage outside. So we had a lot going on. Well, now at TPAC, you have three theaters. You have the Jackson, you have the Johnson, and you have the Polk, right? Correct. Yeah. And, the Jackson and then we also have War Memorial. Oh, that's true. War, that's right. War Memorial, too, that you and I talked about maybe collaborating on. So, but we'll we talk did. about that. Too. And that could have, and we could talk to Patty Lapone about that, too, but we'll talk about that another time. Okay. Uh, so, so, and the Jackson, which is the largest theater of the three, is what, 2,500 seats? Is that correct? Uh, just under that, yeah. It's about 2,400. Little over, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody wants to know when is TPAC coming back? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it's tough to say. I mean, we're so dependent on touring Broadway. Uh, you know, we work with the agents and the routes all across the United States and Canada, and so we're dependent on when the tours go out. So we need the tours to start up and, and we think the road is going to get going sooner than maybe Broadway in New York, but it really depends. You know, the artists, as you know, Patrick, you've toured before, you need that consistency going mm -hmm. from market to market. So the tours have to be able to have the same, you know, experience and they have to take care of travel, getting their sets and scenery across. So we have been ever since March just shuffling and rescheduling and moving things around. It has been, you know, for us, it's, you know, we're trying to get everything that we promised people in the spring and in the fall rescheduled out so that we can bring everything we promised to Nashville. So we're working hard to do that, but we're hoping for spring. I mean, that's what we're, we're planning on. Yeah. Us, us too. It seems to be sort of a domino effect. And and when when you come back, because and I've talked a lot about this to my friends in New York and other artistic directors and stuff, what safety plans do you think will be put in place? Well, we've already started um, changing out things like our filters and our HVAC system. We've added hand sanitizer sanitizing stations. We have protocols for how we deal with our equipment, how we, um, you know, we have a great security and safety team that has put together a fantastic plan. Uh, we've been um, working, we've been advised by Vanderbilt. We've been working with uh, the local Metro um, Public Health Department. So, you know, we're, we feel really confident about our plan. It's just when the pro, you know, the artists can come in and, and people feel safe coming back to an indoor location. I just don't think it's quite time yet. So we've, they, we've you know, it's interesting. Show. We we had I, we had mentioned because we were talking about, you know, cabarets and stuff like that. And and we had Adam Pascal yeah. here. And he did his yeah. cabaret and he did it outside and it was and it was great. And and we were originally going to put it inside at a very small amount of people in a 300 seat theater, like 50 people. But I kept thinking that even if, if we had put it inside and these people wanted to go and we'd sold all the tickets and stuff, I kept thinking, how would they feel being inside for the first time in quite some time? And that is going to be a reverberate. That's going to I think that's going to carry over. I think even when we get a vaccine for this thing, people are going to be have a weird sense of feeling once they go into a theater because it's, it had been so long, you know. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And and we study that pretty closely. You know, our audience has been kind enough to participate in audience surveys. And we've been looking at data and we've been talking to our patrons and our subscribers. And, you know, we want them to feel safe as well as our artists on stage. So, you know, I think communication is the key. And just we're losing you a little bit. Oh, I'm, I'm losing you a little bit. I'm, Jen, I'm losing you a little bit sound wise. Can you? We're really excited about. Jennifer, we're having a little technical difficulty with you. Is it is, is that a live stream thing or is that a Facebook thing? I'm ha we're having we're having a, for some reason we're having a tough time hearing you, Jen. Um, hmm. Wonder if that. What, what do you think, William? What do you think? I've got my guys 
working on it immediately. Oh, uh, we're going to me. You know, uh, so anyway, we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulty with Jennifer. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting what she was saying about about the the problems or, or thinking about how we come back. You know, we've talked a lot about friends of mine in New York and opening theaters there and, and how they're going to do that. And I think she would concur with this, that um, that maximum capacity is what definitely Broadway has to function at. They have to have full capacity to, you know, to even get near making money. It's always been that way. And as we know, in New York, everybody's on top of each other anyway. And there was a great article I read um, in the Washington Post about that the, that the restaurants and the um, bars need Broadway and that Broadway needs the restaurant and the bars. So, so it's all sort of, it's a domino effect. Do you think we can get Jennifer back on? Is she here? Shall we try again? He's trying to bring her back. Oh, he's trying to bring you back, Jen. There you are. Hi. Oh, there we are. Now we're back. So uh, did you hear what I said about, about the maximum capacity thing? I is did. That, is that true for you guys too? Absolutely. Yeah, the financials just don't work otherwise. I mean, there are some things that we can do with local artists that definitely we can work on social distancing. But yes, the um, you know Broadway and some of the other bigger tours need the maximum capacity. Wow. So I want to I want to change it. So you apparently are have a gift for actually designing <laughs> and, and putting together performing arts centers. Is this true? <laughs> Patrick, I think you're going, you know, in a totally wrong direction. Yeah, I have some construction and project <laughs> experience, but I would certainly not take credit for any architecture or design. Oh, well, because I was going to ask you if you could do some drywall at my house. <laughs> I thought you're perfect. Okay, so but this yeah. skill that you have with designers, how do you and on a huge massive level like a performing arts center, how did you acquire that? Oh, well, it just you know, the theaters that I work for happened to have, you know, projects going on uh, when I was there and so I just got to learn a lot from the, you know, the people that were involved in them, you know, the Auditorium Theater in Chicago was a built in 1889 and we decided to redo the restrooms in the basement so when you do go and start digging around the basement of an 1889 year old building you find lots of really crazy things down there so i just you know i just learned a lot on the job and i had the opportunity to work on the construction and, and design of a performing arts center outside of chicago and that was a great experience and yes i say it says that you spearheaded the successful completion of the 56,000 square foot Julianne and George, is it Argu Arturos? Arduous Plaza. Arduous Plaza. Yes. And it provides a year job. round free outdoor performances for the entire Orange County. You did all that. Well, with a very talented team of people, yes. And we programmed over 100 events outside on that plaza. And I believe that that is now the key to Segerstrom's reopening is they're gonna be able to do some outdoor events out on that plaza. But we put a cafe and, and you know, all sorts of amenities out there, free Wi-Fi, probably better Wi-Fi than I have here. And, and, you, you, know, have, and you have any plans for TPEC? Oh, well, you know, I don't know, Patrick. We'll have to stay tuned on that one. Maybe we could talk again. Oh, we will. Well, uh, well, I wanted to leave that up hanging because I want I want all our our friends and uh, and and fans in in Tennessee to keep that in mind, and also I want them to email you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a joy to see you, and and thank you um, so much for coming on. Uh, as as we have met already several times, I can't wait wait for us Studio Ten and you to collaborate. You know, I we I want to do that desperately. And we will do that again when we can all do this again, you know, yeah. um, and you are a joy and it is great to see you. Enjoy your time in North Carolina. OK, thank you, Patrick. Congratulations on the show. And thanks for having me tonight. You're awesome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see Bye. you. Bye bye. So there's there's our story with TPAC, and um, we all take our, our notes from the, the the big the big people. And um, and speaking of big people and people that know New York and know Broadway, uh, what do I say about this person? Well, let's start with this long, wonderful list. She is the Theater Hall of Fame inductee that has won two Grammy Awards, two Tony Awards, and two Olivier Awards, most recently seen in uh, Marianne Elliott's new production of Company, 
as Joanne, winning the What's on the Stage Award and the Olivier Award for her performance. Recently, she made her debut with the New York City Ballet as Anna in The Seven Deadly Sins. I saw you, Patty, in that. You were amazing. Winner of the Tony Award, the Drama Desk Award, Outer Critics Award for Best Actress in a Musical, and the Drama, uh, Drama League Award for Outstanding Performance of the Season for her performance as Madame Rose in the most recent Broadway production of Gypsy. A graduate, graduate, I'm going to talk to you about this, of the first class of the Drama Division of New York's Juilliard School and a founding member of John Hausman's The Acting Company. Some other Broadway, just some other Broadway credits include The Anarchist, Anything Goes, War Paint, Women on the Urge of a Nervous Breakdown, The Cradle Will Rock, Noises Off, Oliver, Avita, for which she also won her first Tony Award, <laughs> Working, and The Robber Bridegroom, we're going to talk about that. The original Fontaine in Les Mis, the original, number one. And her film and television credits include The Song Spinner, Driving Miss Daisy, Witness, Parker, David Mamet's Heist, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Penny Dreadful, Girls, American Horror Story, Glee, Glee Hollywood, and Frasier. Please say hello to, oh God, am I such a fan, Miss Patty Lapone. <laughs> you doll, thank you. I could go on and, and push on. back. That was this much of your bio. This uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you look beautiful. Thank you, Patrick. You look very handsome. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to flirt with you all night. Sorry, <laughs> I just have to do it. So I want to talk to you. I have so many things to ask you. We're going to have so much fun. But I want to talk. Do you remember? Oh, who's this? Oh, my God, Elisa Olivia. We're going to get this all night. So Look so excited for this show. These are all, there we go. There's, uh, there, that's our, and there's Jennifer. Pinch me. It's Patty Lapone. Yes, it is Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer was on the show too. So do you remember the first time we met? No. Oh, God. Oh, oh I do. No, COVID has my brain. COVID's got my brain. It's got everybody's brain. Yeah, and I can't remember anything anymore. Okay, that's okay. I'm I remember it. I I will I will remember remember it always. Okay, so it was at the Sondheim tribute to Carnegie Hall. And when you when you sang Being Alive, and I did the thing with Victor Garber, and this is how we met. I well, first of all, I was I, I was a ridiculous fan. You don't know this, but I saw you in a Vita before it went to New York. In LA. Yes, in Los Angeles, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when I became a Patty Lapone like fanatical fan. Thank you. So then, and trust me, there's a, there's going to be all the times, that, and the second time I met Patty, and the third time I met Patty. So this was the first time. And what happened was, I was in the green room watching you do Being Alive, and sat there in just awe. And I thought, I have to meet her. And for some reason, our paths didn't cross backstage until the party. And you were sitting and you were and you were, you had a martini <laughs> and all of a sudden from across the room about 15 feet away I hear hey doll <laughs> and you were looking in my direction <laughs> and I came over and you were so kind and you hugged me and I was done I was done <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago that was what 1992 yeah, yeah there see COVID hasn't done it. You're good. You're, yeah, you were unbelievable. So we have uh, we have so many things to show that that was the first time. And 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 then it was about, okay, when's the next time? When can I get to see We worked together so beautifully in Annie Get Your Bed at Ravinia and had a ball. Beyond. 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 And I will get there, but I have to show our, our viewers the first time I met you, your performance of being alive from that night at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. So ready? This is Patty Lapone with Being Alive. Wow. <laughs> oh, it was a long time ago. Yeah, but I, I, I've, I've seen you. Look, see, we are all dying, Patty. That's my wife saying that to you. That's Melissa saying Melissa. that to you. You uh, um, okay? So that's just a glimpse. Now I want to go back with you. Tell me before um, Sondheim thing before Avita. Tell me about the John Hausman. Well, we were. Um, I went. Uh, 
I uh, I was I went I was a, a member of the first class of the Juilliard Drama Division in 1968. In order for them to move down, in order for Juilliard School of Music to move down to Lincoln Center, it had to become a complete performing arts wing. So they added a drama division. Michelle Zandini and John Hausman were the co-artistic directors. And um, after the four years, John's idea, Mr. Hausman's idea, was to form an ensemble uh, like APA Phoenix like the Mercury Theater. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was training actors, ho hoping that this would happen. And it, it in fact did. When we graduated from Juilliard, we were given our equity cards and a seat on a bus. And we toured for four years, classical theater, classical plays, six plays, 50 weeks out of the year. And the, and the, and the um, repertoire changed every, every season. Uh, it was an extraordinary experience. It was the it was the experience that gave me my technical armor, and I would have to say my emotional armor too, because we were thrown into say we were kids, mm -hmm. vulnerable, inexperienced kids, and we didn't know um, a, a great many things that have to do with life and that have to do with theater or show business, and it was sort of trial by fire, uh, and. I thank God that I went on the road and honed my craft uh, with the acting company. Uh, thank you, John Hausman. Um, it, you know, we would we didn't know how to tour, so in the first year we lost all of our bookings. We only did these plays for three days or three nights at Juilliard, and so when we came to the fourth performance, it fell apart. We didn't understand maintenance. We didn't. We didn't. And then they <laughs> they had a touring company book us called Herbert Barrett. We used to call him Grin and, Bar Grin and Barrett because he was used to booking chamber orchestra, not chamber orchestras, not massive Elizabethan Jacobean restoration sets right. and costumes. And we were on one night stands, you know, and, and I say this in my book that, you know, we would, we would travel 10 hours, arrive at the theater, throw up, put on a corset, do the three sisters, go to a motel, take, go to sleep, get up the next morning, do another 10 hours, to another city, could be another state, uh, put a, do a different show. So it's, so it was really rep, it's like rep, but rep, rep on the road, rep on the road. Re revolving rep on the road. Wow. And it, it, you know, I, I remember when we, when we arrived in Conway, Arkansas, we were doing the three sisters and I was, I said, why do we always have to do the three sisters or check off in the boondocks? That audience was faster and smarter than we were. Um, so I don't underestimate audiences across this country, um, especially the Midwest where they, well, I, I would have to say every place. I, I don't underestimate the audiences. They are more jaded in cities than they are in rural environments. And they're more, um, uh, I think, probably ignorant than the, than, than the Midwest or the Southwest or the, or the South because they don't get the theater. Mm. So they're hungry for it and they prepare for it. And that was a big learning experience. And then, of course, the bad experiences were insane we were heckled in st joe missouri we were doing the time of your life and as if it's as if these these kids had nothing to do so they bought tickets just to heckle the cast mm. and we had we had gay men in the company and that was being slung up on the stage and the straight guys in the company was about to be a rumble i don't and we got on the bus that night going what where are we and why why are we doing this? Oh. And we had some pretty intense experiences, but as I said, it armed me in 15 years, in four years for 50, you know, 15 years experience in four years. For it was your, unbelievable. For your whole career. Did, did, yeah. uh, how many, how many actors in the company? 21. Wow. And then when we started, we had one stage manager who also did the lights, one wardrobe person and one prop person. And that was like crazy. And, and the wardrobe person, Karen Eifert, and she's still a wardrobe supervisor on Broadway, but she, she also taught us that if we take off our costume, and we're talking restoration costumes, Jacobean co major costumes, if we drop them on the ground, that's how she put them in the road box. That's how we got them the next night. Wow. So she taught us to hang up our costumes, to care for our costumes, to care for our props. Yeah. Um, and that's a very big lesson. Yeah, she taught you. She they they it taught you the the etiquette of the theater. 
Yes. And what we do, yeah, no. And what the actor is responsible for. For. When, 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 I, when I work in television or film, the, the, the on-set dressers always know, they said they always know who comes from the theater because they hang up their costumes. Yep, they hang it up. Yep, you're right. I say, I say that all the time. All the, that I, I teach, I say all the time. Uh, so one of the shows that you did with John Hausman's company was The Robber Bridegroom, right? Yeah. And with well, Kevin. Make it as a jaybird. What? Yeah. I, I was going to get to that question. I know. <laughs> I I got to play Jamie Lockhart. I bet you did. I bet you were great back oh, there. God, I love that part. And it's not done a lot. Although the roundabout did it like two years ago or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, but okay. So tell me about that because I know you were naked on stage. It was first time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last time? Yeah. Was it, was it, was it was the first time for sure. I got the hair, you know, the hair came down and covered right, up, right, right. And covered up my, my <laughs> part. And then, the, the, you know, and the trees covered. Well, our production was pretty extraordinary. Um, David Sadler did, I mean, uh, Donald Sadler did the choreography. Jerry Friedman directed it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was actors who sang. So we understood the slapstick of the script. That's my objection with the roundabout uh, production. It was not funny. And oh, this thing really? is- I, did, I didn't no. see it. No. Was, and that show is very funny. It's so funny. Yeah. It's so funny. And it was it was sort of, you know, I don't know what it was, but, but um, our production was pretty funny. Um, and the choreography and the staging was spectacular mm -hmm. with a combination of Donald Sadler and Jerry Friedman. And, you know, we, Toured that one <laughs> around the country and did a, a run. This is very interesting because um, we came to the Harkness Theater. So we were in a Broadway run with five plays. One was The Rubber Bridegroom during the musicians' strike of oh. that 1976, I think. Um, and because we were recorded, we were allowed to go on because we only did one week of each play. We were in residence for a month at the Harkness Theater. So the, the Robber Bridegroom was one week and, and we thought, oh no, we're not gonna be able to do the Robber Bridegroom, but, but Equity allowed us to. And that was my first Tony nomination. Oh my gosh. And, and Kevin, was he great in that part? I mean, Kevin was, sometimes he was, sometimes he was. <laughs> sometimes he was That's like- right. It's such a good part for him though. Oh, it's great. It's a yeah. great part. Oh yeah. my God, it's a great part. But sometimes, I don't know, Kevin, I guess, didn't feel it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we it was pretty damn funny. What happened when it went to New York? Because I've heard, I mean, to Broadway. Oh, well, if you want to know the whole story, it's in my book. The whole story is John Houseman saw the St. Clemens production with Rhonda Coulee and... Raul Julia, I think it was Raul Julia, I could be mistaken. He commissioned it, he optioned it for the act company. And we were made to audition for our parts. And I thought, well, I'm looking around, nobody else here sings. If I don't get it, uh, um, <laughs> Kevin auditioned for the St. Clemens production and didn't get it. Oh. Kevin auditioned for the acting company and got it. Um, I got a Tony nomination, or Alfred Urey got a Tony, a Tony nomination. This was such a success on the road that Mr. Hausman wanted to bring it to New York after we did it in New York. Uh, and we all had to re-audition for our parts. Oh no. And I got a Tony nomination. And Kevin auditioned and didn't get it. So Kevin auditioned for it twice and only played it one, three times, and only played it once. I. I was so insulted and I said to Margot Harley, I said, you not only negating my talent, but you're negating the training of me right. because it was the exact same people. It was Jerry Friedman who taught us at Juilliard. It was Bob Waldman. It was Alfred Urey. It was John House. It was Margot Harley. They were everybody that was involved with this production, with the acting company and John and Margot with our training at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. And I would not audition. I went, you know what? This isn't, it's such an insult. Oh. And they said, would I stand next to Barry Boswick? And I went, okay, I'll do that. But the thing that happened was I got a, I had on one of our breaks with the acting company, um, I auditioned for The Baker's Wife, for Genevieve and The Baker's Wife. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, I was with Kevin at the time and we were in Ann Arbor in uh, 
in a motel room waiting because we had a month's residency in, at, at the power center in Ann Arbor. And I, and it just through my stream of consciousness, it came out, oh, the uh, baker's wife went into, re went into rehearsal today. And then when we got off the road, um, or whether, rather we left the acting company, Kevin and I, 11 members of the company after four years left, um, I got a telephone call from Helen Nickerson, who was David Merrick's general manager, mm -hmm. and said, we want you to replace Carol Demas in The Baker's Wife. And I, I was dumbfounded because I was right in the middle of the whole Robert Bridegroom thing. And I called Mr. Hausman. I had I had a, a, a meeting with him, and I called Mr. Hausman. I said, I have to cancel the meeting because I've been offered a part in California in a musical. And he paused, and he said, don't sign anything until you talk to me. And I went, you know what? It's too late. You, It's too late. Mm -hmm. So you know what I mean? This is you. Sh this is something I, I was so hurt by this. Yeah, of course, I, now I, everybody's blaming everybody else. But you know, Margot Harley says it was Bob Waldman, Bob yeah. Waldman, enough about that, whatever. Yeah. But so then I went and did The Baker's Wife, which was the biggest flop. <laughs> and there, at the time, at the time, I, you probably remember this in California. There was the Civic Light Opera. Sure. So you'd play the you'd play the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in L.A. Then you'd go up to the Curran in San Francisco. Right. And my brother was doing a chorus line, and we flipped. But but no, so that has nothing to do with it. What I, what I'm trying to say is, we I kept reading the reviews of the Baker's Wife. I mean, of, of Robert of Robert Bryger. Wow. Was a big hit. And you know, a major flop. You I know, think. I had. I had the same experience, and I'll just quickly tell you. When I did Aida, I auditioned for Disney uh, for the Nash first national tour, and I auditioned, and I had one of those great auditions. I knocked it out of the park for Robert Falls, the director, uh, Stuart Oaken, who was the uh, the rep for Disney at the time, and they offered me the role. And the money, well, we know Disney's not incredibly generous. Uh, the money wasn't great, and I and I said no. I had a quote, and I was like no. So I, I turned it down. They said see you, Pasadena. So. Then I'm doing, now I'm doing uh, Frank Butler on Broadway in Andy Get Your Gun. And I, five, six months have gone by and they they come back to me and they said, Patrick, we want to offer you the part. We'll pay you what you want if you come back in an audition. Oh, oh my fucking God. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I said, and I said, I didn't say quite that, but I said, <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, um, wait, wait, you want me to audition for something that you offered me already? You want me to audition? And now my hair is white because I'm doing Frank Butler and I didn't prepare and I hadn't forgot the songs. And they said, yeah, yeah. And I said, no, I'm not coming. I said, you offered me this role. I said, I, because I knew that I could only lessen the audition. Even if I nailed it. It's there, an insult you know, to your talent. It's an insult to your sensibility. It just, it, it's, a, it's an outrage. They already know. Why are they putting this us through this? The same thing happened to me with uh, Kiss Me Kate. I had just come home. I don't know where I came home from. I think it was London, whatever. But Roger Berlin and uh, Biff Liff kept calling. Mm -hmm. They thought I was perfect for Lily. <laughs> Lily, Lily Vanessi. I was going, Lily, Millie, Vanilli. what's her name? <laughs> Lily Vanelli. Lily Vanelli. Lily Vanelli. Lily Vanelli. I said, this isn't my part in the best of all possible worlds. I would have been a Bianca, but I'm not a dancer. Lily Vanessi is a soprano. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, they tortured me, they tortured me, and they called me and they said, you need to come in. It's Michael Blakemore, and I thought Michael Blakemore was a fucking genius. Um, I, I, I He is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to do this. And will you at least sing through the score with Paul Gemignani? And I went, all right. So I went over to Paul Ford's house. Paul Gemignani was there. We had to drop it a key. wasn't that bad. Then they said, would you meet with Michael Blakemore? And I said, of course I'll meet with Michael Blakemore. Um, and I had dinner with him. And then they said, and now you can come in an audition. No. What was that? What was that little phrase that you used the other day? A few minutes ago. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I said, <laughs> it's such a waste of my energy, such a waste of time. And it hurt so bad. And I said, no, wow. I said, there's no way. I'm going to audition. I had to explain this to the director. I said, I want to work with you. But it, what it does is it also affects our quote. Totally. You know, it's, it's just, it's, 
it's insanity that 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 we are put in these positions. It's destructive because it's, you know, say we went and auditioned, we come into the rehearsal room with an attitude. Mm -hmm. Why did I have to go? You knew what you wanted. Mm -hmm. What was the point of me auditioning to humiliate me, to have power over me? Mm -hmm. You know, why why do they do it? And when I what I learned about the Disney thing is that the only time an actor has any power whatsoever is when they go, no. That's right. It's the only time. My first agent said the most respected answer in this business is no. It's true. Yeah. It's, it's true. I'm convinced, and I, I have nothing to compare it to, but I'm convinced I made the most money from Disney that anyone's ever made, at least in that show. <laughs> and they won the world. Jeez. Yeah, it's true. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So as I said to you, I had seen uh, you in I in uh, Aida in Avita in uh, California in LA, and and tell just tell me and tell us about that whole experience. Did you you must have must have had to audition for Hal and must have no. had your uh, audition for Andrew and all that? No, Andrew Andrew really wasn't Andrew at that point. Andrew and Tim were not. Um, the person in control, the person that had all the power was, was, was uh, Hal. Hal was not only the director, but he was also, his office was the general management. So, uh -huh. and Robert Stigwood was the producer who was pretty much in absentia. Uh, so Hal ran, ran the whole show and, and Andrew and Tim went around in rehearsal and, you know, they came to the opening and stuff, but You're they weren't there. Really? No, they weren't there. Wow. Nope. Yep. You know, it had been done in London. This was the New York, I mean, the um, American premiere. And I actually don't know why they were there or they were there and I didn't see them. <laughs> but that's unbelievable. I mean, it's the Broadway company going to Broadway. Well, yeah, um, I got, after opening that, I got two letters from, one from Tim and one from Andrew. And I, and I just stuck them in my scrap because I was, I was a wreck. I couldn't sing it. I did not. I couldn't play the part. I when I got the role, I was doing 1941 in California, and um, I was in my friend's living room, and I thought about what was going to happen to me, and a big smile came on my face, and I went, "That's the way I'm going to play Evita." I said, I'm, "What I said was I'm going to go on a roller coaster ride," and then I went, "That's what Evita did," and I wanted to play her with this knowing smile, look what I got, look what I got, look what I got. And my first day of rehearsal, Hal said to me, I don't want any smiles and gnarled hands. And I went, oh my God, <laughs> I'm totally screwed. At, and, least, at least you made a choice. <laughs> well, I have to say his version didn't work because <laughs> not exact, and I had, I changed it actually in the middle of the LA run while I was, couldn't say it. I mean, my, experience with Evita was the it was trial by fire. This was, you know, I'm I'm born for musicals. This was the biggest test. And I was failing, failing, failing. Wait, I, mm -hmm. I am so confused. This is your first Tony Award. Yeah. But I was failing. I I mean I I it was it was devastating. I mean <sighs> the, first of all it's it's written you know, it's written at a pitch that is what you we call the passaggio. Yeah. All of her high notes. And if you're going to have the Evita Peron harangue, you can't sing it lyrically. Right. It doesn't sound right. So if you're going to be on the you know the balcony of the Casa Rosada and you're going to be haranguing these people, it's on a, it's all the all of the notes, D E F, are in my passaggio, the weakest part of my voice. And I didn't know how to sustain them and I kept blowing out my voice and then of course I was dealing with what Hal wanted me to do which was the audience didn't know what to make of Evita Peron to start off with and the audience didn't know what to make of this whole piece because it was sung through it was modern music sort of modern opera kind of you know Al Hal God bless him took all the rock and roll out of it because the the concept album is Julie Covington, David Essex, and right. Carl Wilkinson, right. and it's rock and roll, really. So he made it more dramatic. And um, But we're used to Rogers and Hammerstein. We're used to tuneful stuff, not dissonant. Mm -hmm. And music was dissonant. 
it was also an exposition. And if you don't read the program, if you don't follow 1944 and 1935, right. you don't really know what's going on. Mandy and I actually had to lasso the audience to go, just let us take you through it. Because the whole thing is just exposition. She's here. She's right. there. She's right. there. She's there. She's there. She's dead. Like, like Superstar. Superstar is very similar too. Yeah, well, yeah. it's difficult to um, hold an audience and it's difficult to sing. And I was a mess. I was, I, the only time, the, the clouds broke for me when I was in the specific, uh, specific heights, is that what it's called? You know, in, Cal in, um, in uh, San Francisco, Pacific Heights, Pacific Heights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mansion. I was in some major house, not a mansion. It was like a big, huge Victorian house that at night the mice would come out and jump in their rat poison. And oh. it was fucking unbelievable. Oh, God. My pillow and all of a sudden, oh, my God. They're, because they would have the rat poison all over the house. And I didn't think to go get me out of this house. And then one night I came home, opened the door, and you could see straight through to the kitchen. And I saw a mouse sort of in a position like this. And I walked and it didn't move. And I looked at it and I went, I did, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. And then I got on the phone and talked to my friend for about 45 minutes. And when I got off the phone, the mouse was still like that. And I got down on the floor and I looked the mouse in the eye and I said, I didn't poison you. <laughs> Not my fault. And the mouse literally went. <laughs> oh, God. Sharing contest. <laughs> no. No. Clouds broke, and I went. You know what? I'm going to figure this one out. I'm not going to be depressed about it. I'm just going to do the work. And I actually went to um, a, a, a man in the chorus, and I said in in L.A. and I said, David, what's the vowel song for glory? And he said, Oh, 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 go for the O. Oh. And he said, Funny you should ask me that, Patty. I said, What do you mean? And he said, My husband asked me last night if I could help you, and I went. You know, the gods, theater gods sent me to you. And I worked with David Bosberg every day from that moment on through the run in New York. Every day I worked with him. And I, and the only time I really felt like I could sing that sc score with abandon was Australia. Really? After New York. But Okay. Okay. So we play a little game on this show. And this is a huge thing for me. I told you, I haven't even gotten to the third time I met Patty, let alone the <laughs> fourth time when, when I worked with her. But we play a little game on this show. It's called Remember the Lyric. Ooh. Now. I can't remember anything. Treat Williams said the same thing. He goes, I can't remember what I ate this morning. <laughs> but this is, I'm not going to, trust me, I, I would never put you in a position of saying. So what it is, is it's a song that you sang. Okay. It's a song that you from a show you know. I will sing the first lyric, okay. and that's the thing that I get to do. I get to sing with you. <laughs> uh, and you, and then I'll point to you, and you come back with me the lyric. Okay. Okay. Now I think okay. this is a good. I think this is the right key. Mm, okay, ready? Don't cry for me, Argentina. The truth is, I never left you. All through my wild days, my mad existence, I kept my promise. Don't keep your distance. Yo, I got to do it. I got to do it. <laughs> Don't cry for me, Argentina, with you. Are you kidding? I'm such a fan. I can't take oh, it. Patrick. You're amazing. Thank you. Well, I'm a fan of yours. You know that. You know how much fun we had. Oh, my God. We had such a blast. Okay, so the second time, the second time I meet Patty LaPone. Okay, now, uh, <laughs> the, oh, wait, 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 oh, okay. So you're doing Gypsy on Broadway, which was your second Tony Award, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember when I brought my mother backstage? I do. Do you I remember do. what you did? I got down on my knees. You shot. Oh my God! You remember? I what do. You did? Your mother means a lot to all of us. Your mother and is is she's a goddess of film. She it, that voice, that beauty. I mean, you're you know, and she's a wonderful actress. She has everything. And I she you know it. 
You're making me cry over my well, mother. I almost wanted to cry. You know, you want you. I I'm a fan. I am a tourist, and I'm a fan. And when you meet someone that you have idolized, that um, I don't. I I I fall apart. I don't know what to do because I can't believe I'm I'm actually seeing that person. And when your mom came, I was. I was, you know, awestruck. I was awestruck. Well, honey, I can't tell you what, I mean, I'll never forget that moment. I, uh, you know, cause that was when I had brought um, my mother back to New York cause she didn't really do a lot of Broadway. She had done movies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And we we're doing 42nd street and she was in New York for the fridge. The last time she had been in New York, it, they didn't have microphones. They were sing out Louise. You hit the back row, you know, and so, and I brought her to, and she just went crazy for the show. And you, and I said, I have mom, you have to meet her. And secretly, I just wanted to see you myself. But I, so I brought her back and you came out from the room and you literally got down on your knees and did exactly what you just did. And I will never forget that moment, nor will my mother. Nor will I. She came backstage. You brought her back. <laughs> so that was number two for me. Um, Oh, I have to also ask you, you have become, you know, an, an icon in so many ways, but one specific way is that you have become the cell phone policewoman. Oh, yeah. And and we're going to talk about this, but I'm going to first show, I want to, and by the way, bravo. Thank God you speak for so many of us. And I- It's gotten and, better. What? Oh, it has. It has. Yeah. But we have a clip of you when from, I guess it was Good Morning America, one of those those big talk shows that shows you. So watch this second clip, um, Patty LuPone with the cell phone. Very police. satisfying moment in the theater. We all know how annoying it can be when someone's texting during a show. The actors hate it most of all. So Broadway legend Patty LuPone took matters into her own hands, snatching away the offending phone. ABC's Cecilia Vega has the story. Hi, everyone. <laughs> she is a Tony-winning queen of Broadway. I know it. But this morning, Patti Lapone is starring in a new role, Cell Phone Police. Well, she was texting through the entire first act, and she was sitting right there in the second seat. It was, everybody can see, look how teeny this theater is. And she was oblivious to everybody except for herself and her phone. The legendary star reenacting the real life drama on stage last night. It was right here, it was this lady right here, and I just grabbed the phone and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Lapone snatching a phone from an audience member mid-performance on Wednesday. I feel bad for the, the people that come here to have um, a theatrical experience, and it's ruined. That audience giving Lapone a standing ovation on Twitter. Way to go, Patty. When the lights came back on, an usher returned the phone. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. And, and yeah. the first time was Gypsy? First time that I what with the cell phone where you said we actually called somebody out. Yeah, probably the first time. Because what the audience, what the audiences don't know in every single production that I'm in, I can't speak for any other actor, is how many times we don't stop the show. Oh yeah, that's how many times there. You know, there's a protocol. You tell your stage manager there's a phone, somebody's videoing. They call house management. House management sends down an usher. So that goes on all the time. Mm -hmm. And then when I was pushed to stop, when I, when I was pushed to stop in, in Gypsy, I was loaded for bear. It was, you know, that character leads up to Rose's turn for two hours. Mm -hmm. And it happened. It was an automatic shutter. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was already, you know, on the edge of <laughs> a lot of emotion. And and I just thought, what the? That was the first time. Um, but in shows for days, I never snatched that phone. I, I disagree with that. It was sleight of hand. I, I put my hand on her shoulder. I was looking her in the eye and I just sort of palmed the phone. <laughs> and when I got off stage, it went, I got the phone! <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The magician in you, the magician in you. <laughs> I couldn't believe I got the phone and the, the stage manager was up in, I don't know where they are in the in the Mitzi Newhouse. They're higher up and he, he over, because I gave it to the uh, second AD and um, the second, uh, yeah, the stage manager. And I could hear in the 
on the their phone, you know, you know the, whatever those things are. Um, she got it, yay, Patty, whatever. It was, you know, and she looked like she was an educated, very pretty woman, middle aged woman, very well dressed. What mm -hmm. the fuck? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, and it was the reverse too, because the man she was with, her husband, her boyfriend, was watching the show, and she was ordering online. Mm -hmm. She never put the phone down. <laughs> but it's gotten better, and the and the, the ushers have been more vigilant about okay. it, and audiences have been more vigilant yeah. about. It. Right. Yeah, because you know, even in the in the scenario where like you're a doctor on call, you can get a text and walk out, take the text and leave. You know, you don't have to sit there talking or texting or. Okay, so now. Wait a minute. Do you know that joke? The phone goes off. Hello, I'm at the theater. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. So now we get to the third time. I met Patty LuPo. And this is when we actually got to work together. Yeah. And we did Annie Get Your Gun at Ravinia. And uh oh gosh. Do we have pictures? Show these pictures of us. We I know we have photographs. He's looking for them. Oh, there we are. So there you are. <laughs> and and um what was that one though? What is that song with the gun? Oh, it's just a contest. I can't. I yeah. It's, it's just a contest. I can't get a, can't get a man with a gun. Oh no, it's a, that's that's you and I doing the shooting contest. Yeah, right? yeah, contest. And, and George Hearn played Buffalo Bill. Right. right. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. We were good. I was so we were so good, and I had the most, and I was in heaven. You know, my fantasy had come true to get to work with you and get to not just get to work with you. Okay. Uh, I got to uh, romance you. I got to uh, kiss you. I got to compete against you, and I got to lose against you. It was absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> but do you remember the night at the Hole in the Wall with Frank Gallo? Oh my gosh! Yeah, I got that all the time. I go, I go that night was so spectacular. That yeah, night, it was so amazing. That yeah, and you you had, you told me about that. You had educated me about all that and him and amazing, amazing. How we would, I mean, we would ever, we just, you know, that's the thing about camaraderie in the theaters. You, you, you hope that one hopes, I hope that every time I I'm in a company that it's, it's, it's going to be that kind of come, you know, um, copacetic yep. um, love affair uh, as opposed to the opposite. You hope that, 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 because the, we pass through each other's lives so intensely and so quickly. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then it's over. And you it's know, I, I've said that too. I, you pray for when you're working with a leading lady, you pray for that, that, that trust, that ability to be on stage and you know that you're going to throw the ball back and they're going to catch it. They're there for you and that they'll yeah. throw it back and you're there for them. And, and it's a very odd thing if, because if it doesn't, you know, line up, it can be very difficult going to work every day. I've been in that situation too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's not fun. It's no. not fun at all, you know, and, and then those real acting skills take it, you know, <laughs> do, but, but it's hard. It's just harder work. And it's, and it's, I, I mean, I, but now Patrick, I'm, I'm at a point in my life and my career where I go, if, if I'm not having a good time, I'm just going to quit the show. And I don't want to, I don't want anybody to get fired on my, my account, but I, I can't, I can't invest that much time in unhappiness. Right. I mean, we, we, it's a subjective business. So we put everything that our emotional lives allow into it. So to then have to combat um, something that is, that has nothing to do with you or the play. Yeah. It's not worth it. But you're right. And that is the one great thing about age. I'll, I'll say the same thing is that you go, I don't need it. I don't need it. I have, I have so many people I'd rather hang out with, you know? Yeah. Okay. So you have this, one of the most monumental careers ever in the theater <laughs> and in film, but in, in the theater. And all of a sudden now you get this offer to do this Hollywood. Oh yeah. Which was the number one show. I don't know if you know this during the pandemic it was one of the number one shows on Netflix for a while. I was watched it all. I, I I was like, holy smokes! And what a, and what a part! Yeah, it's a good part. What a, what a part. <laughs> best part I've on camera. Ryan Ryan Murphy, 
who created Glee. Ryan Murphy who created American Horror Story. Ryan Murphy who created Nip Tuck. I mean, this he's a genius, right? So you get this. How did you get the role? How did it all happen? Um, the way one, the way Ryan hands out cards. I, I um, I got a. I was doing Pose. I got a call to do Pose on my first day of Pose. Tanase Popa, who's uh, Ryan's right hand man, said, "What are you doing in September?" Nothing. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, and he said that Ryan wants to write a role for you in Hollywood. And I thought, okay, you know, my age and it's already, you know, in the, the idea has already germinated. So I don't know what I'm going to do in it. But then he told me one, you know, one of the scenes that he wanted to make me the leading lady, but he told me what the, the he told me what the story was going to be. I'm unhappily married. I'm a failed actress. I'm unhappily married. He dies. I get the studio. That's that was the the arc of the character. Mm -hmm. And then I guess he filled it out a little bit. Oh, he did say there would be sex scenes. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I said finally. <laughs> How long have I waited for these? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and but by the way, I have to tell you this, Patrick. It's all so different with with the Me Too you, Me Too movement. And I'm not saying. I'm just saying how it is. Um, we were so padded, and they have a uh, uh, what, what are they calling a sex coordinator? A sex choreographer? Like a sex choreographer? I'm trying to remember what they call him. It's some weird name because we also had it on company. And I went, you know what? I think I know what I'm doing. I'm a trained actor, but okay, what do you want? You know, <laughs> I don't know what they're, they're there to make you comfortable. But I was fortunate that I had two very sensitive. Because uh, my 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 sex scene with with Dylan McDermott was cut, but two very sensitive and responsible actors right. I worked with, and it was sort of like just get it over with. It's not fun. I mean, you've done sex scene; they're not fun. It says, it says an intimacy coordinator. Is that intimacy. It? They're not fun. They're work. No, you're right. I, I said to Dylan when ours was done, which was sexier than the other ones. Um, I said well, that was strangely unsexy. Yeah. It's true because there's so so many of them are, are Nancy Allen says loved her, loved her in Hollywood. Thank it you, is, Nancy. It's a it is a tech. It's technical. It's technical. Okay, Patrick, you're going to turn your head over here now. You're going to kiss. Her. Do you no know, keep no keep your eyes over there. But no, we can't see your mouth, Patrick. Turn around. It, yeah. it becomes like that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was. <laughs> I yeah. It was. It was disappointing. <laughs> 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 well, wait. Well, we have one of the scenes that's not the sex scene. We have a scene that we want to show from Hollywood, uh, Patty LuPone oh. in Hollywood. Wow. <laughs> wow. Hands down. <laughs> Thank hands you. down the best I'm scene watching. in the entire show. Thank you. It's, Thank so, you. it's great, Patty. It's so great to watch you work. But I mean, Melissa and I sat on the couch and watched every one of those those scenes, and, and including the famous staircase scene, which I have to tell you was just as dramatic, just as dramatic. It was fantastic. Uh, and if you haven't seen Hollywood, the staircase scene. I, you know, it's like you know, give me more, Gina. Is all I can say. Give me more. Give me more. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. You know, there are very few people, and I, I, I'm sure you get this all the time. I mean, I know you, and I, I work with you, and I feel some this this love and this, but there are very few people that are icons in the theater. You're what? Yeah. You're an icon in the theater. Oh, thanks. How, how did? How I did didn't say yeah because I was an icon in the theater. It's just that they're 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 they they don't exist anymore. No, they don't. No, and you have. I mean, yes, you've done it a huge amount of television and film, and you've done, but you've you you created a career, a very successful career, an iconic career in the theater. That doesn't happen. Right, it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, it do. but Patrick, for many reasons, it doesn't happen. Um, or for two. Uh, <laughs> for many art oh, too. Um, the first, let me see how I can phrase this. They don't write roles for a specific performer the way they did for Mary Martin, uh, for Ethel Merman, for my father. For my father, same thing. My exactly same. right. Exactly right. They don't write write roles for that particular actor. 
they write musicals and then you are, uh, you know, uh, either in the mix or not. One of many on the revolving turntable. Right. <laughs> and then they don't write the roles that, I mean, the roles that I've played are like unbelievable. They're like larger than life roles. Mm -hmm. When you think about Madame Rose and you think about Edita and you think about Nellie Lovett, they are larger than life characters, mm -hmm. which sort of helps with that image of an icon. But it also the, they've also sort of eliminated the star system um, in theater where they don't want the actor to be more important than the play. And also then the other aspect of this is people use Broadway as a stepping stone mm -hmm. for Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I have just always stayed on the stage. And I, I'll tell you the truth. I've always gone, why don't I go to Hollywood? I happen to love Los Angeles. I love Cal, uh, not a, a LA so much. L I love California. California mm -hmm. yeah, is it's, it's, it's so beautiful. My favorite part of California is Northern California, PCH, Northern California, Mendocino North. And and someday I will. It's by the way, so overcrowded now. It's because everybody loves California, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but so the, P, the, the, the roles, the fact that my career is close to 50 years. That's amazing. On the stage. That's amazing. You know, I mean, I'm still here, basically. What are they going to say? Oh, when I hit a certain age and they were starting to call me legend, we were going, yep, it's because I'm so old. What else are they going to call me? <laughs> you, know, but that, you know, and there's a reality to that as well. I, I, I stayed in the business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Thank you, you. <laughs> Thanks Thanks you are so, I, I, you are so iconic that I, I want to show one other little clip. Um, of you with the people of New York City at the um, stage door of Hamilton with Lynn oh, and nice. Miranda. And it, it's just, uh, I wanted to show a piece of it. And there you are with Lynn Manuel Miranda, who is the Prince of Broadway now, and Hamilton and all of that. And you see him and how he just does what you did to my mother to you, as <laughs> we all do. So let's look at this little clip. Uh, yeah, I don't need to say anymore. There's New York City. There's Lynn Manuel Miranda, and that's Patty Lapone. Now, you know, he did this wonderful thing, and 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 Lynn is just an innovator in every respect, and has just emanates love, 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 and and that's God bless him. Yeah. Um, but he did this thing where they um they had the um lottery, and uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, they had this um lottery and so the, they'd always have a, a group of people in front of the stage door i think on a wednesday matinee i don't know it could be thursday tuesday i don't know but they always had those people and what lynn did was entertain them oh it's so great you know, and and somebody would come and, and sing a song or some of the kids from the cast would come out and do something and then he asked me if i would and i thought you know what give my regards to brother what else? Patty, patty lapone comes out of the stage door <laughs> singing give my regards to broadway what broadway <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, really um, uh, I want to talk uh, a couple last things. I want to uh, first. I want to touch on. I want to talk about company because tell tell us you were in. You were about to open right on Broadway. Yeah, uh, we were. I think. Uh, I don't know. Happy anniversary, everybody! March twelfth, six months COVID. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we uh, we were shut down March twelfth, um, and. Um, we would have opened on Steve's birthday, March 22nd. Oh my gosh. Two days from opening. And uh, we had just had, uh, you know, those Brits can drink, um, <laughs> and our entire creative staff. <laughs> and my, at one of my dressing rooms, well, the, you know, in the, where were we? The Jacobs, uh, I beg your pardon, the Royale. Uh -huh. Excuse me, Bernie, but it's the Royale. The dressing rooms are pathetic. They're really bad. But I had two rooms on the 
first level, one room I made up and one room that I would sleep in, but 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 it was the, the bed they put in there was really, really big. So you could get maybe five people in there comfortable. The entire cast would come in and we would, you know, Mary, if Marianne was having a drink that night, the entire cast would come in. Oh. And we had one of those nights. We had one of those nights where we were drinking and just having a ball. And then the next night, I think they said, That's the word, we're shutting down. Oh. And and Chris Harper, the producer, said, it was about two, two and a half, three weeks. We had heard stuff on the on the street because we heard we heard the word COVID, we heard coronavirus, and then we heard that an usher at the booth, where um, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, had contracted the virus, had it, mm -hmm. and then we heard. So it's on the street now, on Forty Fifth between Seventh and Eighth, and then we heard that. Many members of the Moulin Rouge company right, right. across the avenue, and then, and then when we so you know <clears throat> we they shut us down and we thought okay we'll be back in two three weeks maybe. So then the Schubert said you can go in and you know t get personal stuff. I was filled with such anxiety because we didn't know anything about it. We didn't know how it was transmitted. And uh, my son was with me and I was very, very nervous. I was, I just had a lot of anxiety. And when I left the theater, when I walked across the stage, they had a ghost light on and it looked like a day off. Mm -hmm. Water bottle on the stage manager's prompt table, everything, you know, glasses in my little room after the parties were dirty. It looked like a day off. And I said goodbye to the Royale. And the, I, I said goodbye to the Jacobs. I said, excuse me, goodbye to the Royale. And then I burst into tears like I'm about to do right now because I basically said goodbye to my life in the theater. I have no idea okay. if we'll come back. I don't know when we'll come back. I said to Marianne, by the time we come back, I'll be blind in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? That may come to pass. It's not, you know, uh, they can't bring, they can't do social distancing in the theater. I know you not in those theaters where you're like this up against each other. And, you know. I'm afford to. I mean, the, the, the nut of a, the nut, I don't know what the nut of our show is, but, but if they can't make the nut, the weekly nut. And um, the margin is, I know this now being an artistic director, the, the margin is this, this much when they have full capacity to make money. It's very, I mean, it's a very small, you know, there's very few Hamiltons or Wicked's or they just, you know, they don't exist. Well, see, now that's another problem with Broadway these days. Everybody's banking on another Hamilton, another Wicked, another Mamma Mia. And, and they don't do it for the love of the theater. They don't encourage or they don't support brand new composers and lyricists and playwrights. Mm -mm. They try for that one hit. And then it's, you know, what we're seeing, it looks like Las Vegas to me. It doesn't look like Broadway or New York theater anymore. No. It looks like Las Vegas. And it's like, I, you know, I don't even want to be there anymore. I really don't because it, it doesn't represent what I trained for. It doesn't represent theater. Yeah. But I remember it too. You live, you're in Connecticut, right? Mm -hmm. But you have, ladder, if anybody's curious as to why the ladder is. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We did get a couple of comments. So tell us. Miss I climb it every night and <laughs> to jump off it. Now we <laughs> we have uh, we have um, very high tall windows and they have um, electric blinds, battery operated blinds, and one of them won't close, so we have to change the battery system. But it requires. Can, can you do this? You oh my God. Ah. But we ran out of batteries because it's time to uh, you know change the batteries in all of them. Someday Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Robin. We love you too. Uh, that's okay. Uh, well, if I can get to Connecticut, I promise I'm a little taller than you. I would be more than happy to jump up there. It's a tall one. It's it's up there. It's so like we play we play another. It's three a.m. in Italy. Hi, hi. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Um, okay, so we play another game in the show. Uh, it's called "You Become the Host." And you get to ask me one, only one, one question, anything you want to ask. Patrick, <clears throat> you're such a handsome man. Oh, oh no, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> 
And you're a sexy man? <laughs> How many women have you vetted? Oh, no! <laughs> Who came up with this game? <laughs> Who ever thought of this game? Uh, yeah. Well, one only... I you're a devil. One only substantial one, and that's my wife. <laughs> oh, that's best answer. Oh, good for you. One only substantial. Great answer. question. Oh gosh, why aren't we? Why aren't I on Entertainment Tonight right now? <laughs> um, I want to leave our audience uh, with something. As you were talking about company, I want to show our audience uh, a clip of you in company. Uh, you you play Joanne, you know, and I got to, I, I think I might've told you this. I played Bobby too. I got to do, an, do him when I was 30. I always wished I'd done him even later, but I got to do it. And Carol Burnett played Joanne. Oh my. No, but this, this production that you're seeing is not the production that we've done. And, and Marianne has uh, gender bent it. Bobby is now a woman. And so the conversation that I have with Bobby is two women talking to each other. Right. And there, I think there might be a different inflection in the song or different attitude in the song. This is the one with Neil Patrick Harris, right? Yeah, yeah. And our friend Lonnie Price directed this, yes? Right. So I, I wanna show this and I'm showing it in its entirety be, just because you're, it's so great and it's so important. So uh, we, we here at Studio 10 would like a, to propose a toast to you. Oh, thank you. Patty LaPone. I'd like to propose a toast. Here's to the ladies who lunch. Everybody laugh. Lounging in the caftans and planning a brunch on their own behalf. Off to the gym, then to a fitting, claiming their fat. I'm looking grim, cause they've been sitting Choosing a hat Does anyone still wear a hat? I'll drink to that Here's to the girls who stay smart Aren't they a gas? Rushing to the classes in optical art Wishing it would pass Another long, exhausting day, another thousand dollars. I'm at the day of interfaith, perhaps a piece of mollus. I'll drink to that. And one from Waller. Here's to the girls who play wise, aren't they too much? Keeping house but clutching a copy of lies Just to keep in touch The ones who follow the rules And meet themselves at the schools Too busy to know that they're fools Or a day at jail I'll take a hell Let's all drink to that the best when they get depressed it's a bottle of scotch plus a little chest another chance to disapprove another brilliant singer another reason not to move another So here's to the girls 
long ago Everybody tries Look into their eyes and you'll see what they know Everybody dies As opposed to that invincible bunch The dinosaur is surviving the crunch Let's hear it I um, I cannot thank you enough as my friend uh, for gracing us with your talent and just you, the person you are, a remarkable human being. Oh, Patrick. Well, you I, know I love you. I thank you for your compliments. But you know I love you and I'd do anything for you. Yeah. And I wish you the best success with the theater. Thank you. And I hope, um, you know, <laughs> I hope that, you know, it's successful and I hope you, f you find a way to do a season in this insanity. It is, it is what we, we, we battle with every day of how to figure it out. It's a constant, mm -hmm. constant. And, you know, it's always a, a moving target, unfortunately. That's, that's the real difficult thing is how do we, when? Can we do it today? Okay, if we do this, then, but then it moves and it moves. And so, yeah. but we won't give up. We won't give up. And, uh, and we will have, I will, I will call on you again. And I'll say now, now you are safe and you can come here and we can listen to you in person and we can do all the things that, I'd that love to do. See you. I'd love to just see, love you. To see you too. I love you. I love you too, Pancho. So much. You are you are such a joy, and I and I can't thank you enough. And uh, and I'll drink to you anytime. <laughs> well, let's go out and have a few. Be yeah. safe. Be you sane. Too. Have you some too. fun if you can. Thanks, sweetheart. Give my love to your family. Thanks. Your my my love back to yours. Wow. Mm. What, a, what an evening. What an evening. I, uh, thank you so much to Jennifer Turner from TPAC. Thank you so much to Patty. And, um, and, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, it is a, a, an amazing time just to hang with her, as I'm sure you guys all saw. Thank you, honey. She's my, my wife says, thank you, Patty. Love you. Um, uh, yes, a true, beautiful Italian woman. She is that, Zach and more. Thank you, Pat and Patty, for an awesome show tonight. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, it has been amazing. Um, and uh, I want to remind you all that at Studio 10, you know, we, we survive on donations and we survive on ticket sales. And right now the ticket sales are, are far and few between. So please, it's right there below you. Please give us your donations. We will have many more people on this show if you do. And uh, in fact, next week, we have Lisa Mordante and her mother, Cheetah Rivera, on. So it'll be a mother-daughter thing. And uh, I know something about the mother-son thing, but we're going to talk to her about so much more. So thank you all for our new evening, Monday nights. Those of you who don't watch Monday Night Football, you come and watch Studio 10 Talks. Uh, I don't have a goodbye song tonight because I'm just... I'm just so thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled that you're all here. Thank you so much, John. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Chris Kimbler from Los Angeles. I send my love to you. Good night, everybody.